live from Brooklyn. It's Monday night. And I'd love to introduce the crew to you. First off, from Columbus, Ohio, we have Mr. Donald Culp. Hello, everybody. And then from Nashville, Tennessee, we have Mr. John Tudor. You're muted, John. Yes. Y'all come here to Nashville and see me. <laughs> okay. And then we have Chris Ray up in uh, Connecticut. Hello. <laughs> and down to road a little piece to Houston, we have Mike and Dana Lewis. Hi, y'all. <laughs> oh, we actually get to see Dana. <laughs> and then back to Brooklyn, where I'm still dodging bullets. And I sit at traffic jams and hear all kinds of horns and all kinds of craziness. Um, who wants to open up with a word of prayer? I do, I do, I do. Okay, Michael, go for it. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the magnificent image that you've given us in your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that you've given us a life that can actually project that image in power and even bear witness to the fact that our Lord is a living Lord and Savior, working with us and in us, willing to do of your good pleasure, keeping us on the mark of your righteousness and your goodness, enabling us to manifest what you've called us to be, to be blameless and holy before you in your sights. So we are so thankful for that, for each other, for this wonderful body that you've made us all a part of, and that we can just work together mightily to be good stewards and good image bearers for you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 <laughs> hey, I feel like I'm 13 again. <laughs> All right, so tonight, all right, so Mr. Michael, I hear you've got something as well, so take her away. I got something as well. Thank you, sir, very much. Uh, <clears throat> the, when I was growing up, I had this image in my mind of heaven, and I was a harp, and we were playing a harp in heaven. And that image, uh, I don't know where it came from. I, I have an idea where it came from. But that was all I had, is we're going to be in heaven forever, playing harps for Jesus or something. I don't know. Um, when I started learning the word, I, I learned that uh, we're going to be gathered together before the wrath of God comes, before the writings of the book of Revelation comes. And uh, we're going to be caught up in the air with him, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And that was very comforting to me. It was very, it enriched my soul a lot more than playing a harp in heaven forever, especially since I'm not very good with stringed instruments. Piano, maybe. Harp, nah. Um, but even that, after dwelling on that for a while, so shall I ever be with the Lord doing what? <laughs> I mean, that's a question that we should ask. What, what is our hope? So shall we ever be with the Lord? Uh, probably one of the biggest things in the last year that opened up to me by our lovely Miss Chris uh, was the fact that we were reading something from the Hebrew writings. And we know that the Hebrew writings are not written to us. They're written for our learning. Uh, but the Hebrew writings from Genesis all the way through Malachi is about the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the Christ. And there are a lot of promises made to people along the way to the coming of Christ. I mean, look at Abraham. I mean, God promised a lot of things to Abraham. He promised him land. He promised him his heirs would be like the sands of the seashore. 
he promised that out of his loins was actually going to come that Messiah, that promised seed that God promised back in Genesis 3.15. So there, and, and Abraham just won. There's, uh, there was promises made to Noah. There were promises made to David. There were promises made to Moses and the children of Israel. A lot of promises were made. And some of those promises were attached to covenantial relationships to where God would conditionally provide for that person or that group over the, the, the period of their existence as long as they would keep their end of the bargain. God, God would bless them as long as they would do what was written in the covenant. Um, but there was only one promise. Everything was contingent on one promise. All the promises and all the covenants of God were contingent on one promise, and that was the promise of the coming Messiah. And there were a lot of promises made to him. I mean, there were a lot of things God said about the Messiah that were solely written directly to him. <clears throat> Even with the uh, Davidic, uh, David's covenant relationship that he had with God, it was a foreshadowing of what God would do for the Messiah. David's heart was, <coughs> excuse me, David's heart was a rendering of, a foreshadowing of that coming Messiah. We look at Joseph's life and the way that he served under the second command in Egypt. It was a foreshadowing of that promised seed. There were attributes in these people's lives that when Jesus Christ read the word, he knew that was written about him. He knew who he was. He knew that the word of God was his prescription for his life. Not only when he walked on the earth, but when he returns. The big gap that's in there is us. <laughs> he didn't know about us. Jesus Christ never met a Christian. He never knew anything about Christianity. Everything that he projected in his time on earth in the Gospels was a projection of Genesis through Malachi. Everything that had been written to that point about him and what would happen. And there was a lot of things written about future in there. I mean, all you, you don't have to read Daniel for but a little bit and find out <laughs> Daniel got some heavy revy on what was going to happen in the end times, in the latter days, or however you want to work. But, so Jesus Christ knew what he needed to accomplish in his first coming when he was born from a woman out of the line of David. And he knew what he would accomplish at his return. He knew that he would suffer and die, and he would be raised into glory, and that he would bring God's kingdom to the earth. That's why he started the kingdom of God is what? <laughs> near the kingdom of heaven is near that was how he started his ministry and the gospel writings but he didn't know about us he did not know about this time period now the question that comes up all the time and we ask it all the time too is <laughs> what what did jesus know and when did he know it and the more i study the word the more i really believe that he knew a lot more after he got up from the dead than he knew before we went down. I'm going to review some things that we reviewed before uh, on different segments at different times. But in Acts chapter 1, uh, during the 40 days that Jesus Christ was on earth after his resurrection, he begins uh, to address his, his, his disciples, his apostles at uh, that time. In Acts 1, 4, it says, on one occasion when he was eating with them, 
nice to know that in the new bod after the resurrection, he still had an appetite. So maybe it was cookies. He gave them this command, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John truly baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with Holy Spirit. Now, this, this section here is very interesting, especially if you go back some 50-some days before that and start reading the gospel accounts of how Jesus described the end times. Now, to me, what is very interesting, number one, the, the, this, the, the gift is not in there. It's really, but wait for the promise of the Father, which you have heard me speak about. The question is, this promise of the Father, when did he speak about it? Now, clearly, in, in the Gospel of John uh, 14 through 17, Jesus Christ communicates a lot because he knows he's fixing to die. And he knows that they're going to be without him for the first time. And he communicates a lot about the comforter and about his prayer to God is so awesome. But that, that he did not know the secret then. He's talking about rhetorically himself in his resurrected form. John the Baptist asked a question when he was in prison. He sent a man to Jesus Christ and said, are you the one, or do we wait for another? Are we to expect another? Because that difference between the sufferings of our Lord Jesus Christ and the glorification were so contrary to one another, so different looking to one another, that a lot of believers believe there were two different people coming. They actually believed that because they saw the sufferings and they saw the glorification. And even Jesus himself spoke of himself as the comforter. And he spoke to them. He, he spoke to them in, in a manner to where they would have understood that the spirit would, that would be with them would be in them also. Speaking of a later date, talking about the resurrection of the dead. Nobody expected the prophecy of John the Baptist when he ministered. He said, I am baptized with water, but there is one coming who will baptize in Holy Spirit. John, John, the Baptist, prophesied of that. Everybody knew there was going to be a resurrection, and in that resurrected life, God, through his, the, through his Messiah, was going to usher in a new, a new covenant with and give new life to those believers that had stood faithful in the Hebrew writings. What they didn't know is Jesus Christ in verse 5 says, in a few days you will be baptized. This is, <laughs> this is, not, that's, you know, I used to, I used to read verse 6 and it would, it would, I, I used to think all these dummies, uh, if hindsight was as good, if foresight was as good as hindsight, right? Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? But the more I read this, that would have been their natural inclination by his comment. Wait for the promise of the Father, which you've heard me speak about. For John truly baptized with water, but in a few days you will be immersed in Holy Spirit. It's, verse 6 is a logical comeback from what they understand. And it's a question. It's a good question. When they gather around them, are you going to, are you going to, is this, is this it? You're going to restore the kingdom? You're going to take over? You're going to bring Israel up as the light of the world? And raise the dead? Are we going to get? They're, they're asking that question. And it's a good question because it would, from what they have been taught, being immersed with Holy Spirit would have been in line with the restoration of the kingdom of Israel. <coughs> but he said to them in verse 7, It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father is set by his own authority. So, He's, he's putting that aside. That is not the way he communicated in Matt 24 and 26 when they asked him about the end times. He gave them some detail. Not all of you will die. <laughs> some of you will still be here. 
he gave them some specific detail about what was going to take place over the next, what we perceive as about seven years. But this is what he said to them. Then he said, it is not for you to know the times of the dates the Father has set in his own authority. This is really new detailed information. And it's not that he didn't know that the, the times and dates were set in God's authority. It's the fact that this specific thing now is in God's authority. Jesus knows things he didn't know before. And he puts them right back on track with verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. On you is upon you. On you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, that's the other thing here. They are going to be sent out to be witnesses because they are going to receive spirit. Witnesses of Jesus Christ. And it's not just a Jewish thing. It doesn't say to the Jews and to the Judeans and to the Samaritans. It says specific geographic areas showing a expansion all the way to how far? <laughs> the ends of the earth. Now, that was going to happen in the millennial kingdom. Israel would be the light on the shining hill that spread to the four corners of the earth. But that was not in the program before that. I mean, just read the book of Revelation. It's actually an angel in the, broadcasting the gospel during that time to get people to believe. Uh, the millennial kingdom was a very special time for Israel, for God, through his Messiah, to fulfill all the promises and covenants that had been made in the Hebrew writings. So, again, this, this is a question they're asking, are you at this time going to restore? Was a logical, relevant question. And then, of course, he very lovingly sets them back on track. Uh, the promise here, the promise of the Father, again, I have a line through gift here, my Father's promise uh, is, the, is an adjective it's relating to or denoting the case of a noun, something the Father has promised. Wait for the promise of the Father, which you have heard me speak about. Uh, it is not for you to know what time or season, the time or the season of the restoration of the kingdom of Israel, as, of Israel as that light. So he's getting very specific here, but there is definitely a change of track. The word promise here is espengilia, which is literally a proclamation or an announcement. Wait for the announcement of my father. God was going to do something huge, and Jesus knew it. How much of it he knew, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I think he, he, I think he told him what he knew. I think he told him what he knew. He always told him what he knew. He, he told his 12 all the time, I've... I haven't held anything back from you. Everything God has showed me, I showed you. So I think he told him. He knew there was an announcement coming. He knew that they were going to get power and authority. And he knew they were going to have spirit. They were going to have spirit. Um, Epi Angela, uh, Angela is, the, is literally the upon or the upcoming announcement, the upcoming announcement. Uh, angelios, where we get our word angel for messenger, the message. Wait for the message that's coming up. And boy, what a message they got. Uh, uh, throughout, Espengilia is a legal term that refers to an official sanctified promise. Now, there's only a few places in the Christian writings where this word is plural. Because God has made many promises, but they were all contingent on the promised coming one, the promised Messiah. Uh, almost everywhere in the New Testament, the word promise, espengilia, uh, it says points back to the Old Testament. I think that's a little deceiving uh, because specifically here, because in Ephesians, it says, Nobody knew the secret. Nobody. God hid it in himself. 
Nobody in the other ages knew about it. Uh, this word hear, you, the th that you heard me speak about, or you have heard me speak about, a present active tense, uh, it's uh, actually a wristic, something he has been doing. I, I believe the way this word is used, it's something that has been being done recently. In other words, since he got up from the dead, he's been redirecting them just like he's doing here. He's been redirecting them toward the task at hand. Wait for the promise of the Father. Uh, it's properly to hear, uh, figuratively to hear God's voice, which prompts faith within you, which, which drives you to faith. Uh, Akali is uh, hearing with your inner spiritual hearing, your <laughs> revelation. Uh, hearing that goes with receiving faith from God, spiritual hearing, discerning God's voice, listening. So which you have heard, which you have perceived in what I am saying to you. Uh, and, of course, this word with is actually the, the little Greek word en. Uh, you will be immersed in Holy Spirit. Uh, one of the neatest little prepositions in the Word of God, especially when you think of the fact of us being in Christ Jesus is used 293 times in the Christian writings. Uh, it's a real cool preposition, being in Christ Jesus. However, this part, when the power... You will receive power when the Panuma Hagion comes upon you. God was fixing to do something dramatic here. As I said earlier, ever since Genesis 3.15, where God said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. As we all know, women ain't the one with the seed, so if the woman, if there's going to be a woman that's going to have a seed, God is going to create that seed in that woman, which he did uh, when he spoke to that wonderful young lady, Mary. But ever since the promise that has been made here in Genesis 15, the subject of the Bible has been God's promise, the promise of the man that he would send to take care of the problem that has come up concerning sin. And this problem isn't a problem that came with Adam. Now, for its result to mankind, and certainly what Jesus had to accomplish as a man to redeem mankind, absolutely. But this problem, if you remember God talking to Adam in the garden, he said, stay away from that tree, right? So the evil thing was already there. So this, this was going to have to be dealt with by man. That was God's purpose for man to deal with this anyways. However, <laughs> Adam was supposed to deal with it, not join in with the gang. <laughs> he was supposed to deal with it. He was supposed to stand against it. Do not eat. Do not stay away from that dang tree. Oh, George of the jungle, I guess. I, stay away from the tree, George. In Psalms 4-7, it gives a description of a prophecy of our Lord Jesus Christ. It says, and lo, and, I, and then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. And that word written there can also be translated prescribed for me. In the volume of the book, it is prescribed for me. That, that, that prophecy is repeated in Hebrews 10, 7, where it says, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. The, the, the Bible is written about many wonderful believers, but the primary force of the Bible was concerning this promise, who he would be, what he would do, and how God would bless him. In Psalms 2, 7, it says, I will proclaim the Lord's decree, he said unto me. You are my son. Today I have become your father. Now, this, if you follow this through the writings, you'll find out that that is talking specifically about the 
after resurrection of our Lord, not the physical. This it's literally today I have begotten you. <clears throat> when Mary, when when Jesus was born the first time, he was born of a woman. He was born of a woman. When he was born again, he was born from above of God. God born him. And the text here, and you can see it in a lot of the translations, it's, it's repeated, there's another one repeated in Hebrews. You are my son, today I have begotten you. And read verse 8. What is he going to do when he has begotten him? Ask me. God said, quote, ask me. And I will make the nations, plural, your inheritance, the ends of the earth, your possession. Now, we know when Jesus Christ came in his earthly ministry the first time, that his ministry to, was to the lost sheep of Israel. He wasn't called out to the other nations to minister to them. Not that they didn't get blessed. They definitely got blessed. I mean, we know thing about the uh, the uh, Roman soldier and how they got blessed and the woman that actually corrected the Lord and said even the dogs eat the crumbs falling from the master's table. They got blessed, but that was not his ministry. But when he comes back, he's got to fulfill the promise made to Abraham because while Abraham's a promise of his seed being as the sands of the seashore. Uh, Abraham was also promised that all the nations would be blessed because of him. That because of this seed that was going to come out of the Messiah, that was going to come out of the lineage of Abraham, all the nations would be blessed because of him. And the idea is that when the kingdom of heaven is set up and Israel is set up as the capital of the world, that Jesus Christ would rule the world. He would be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So I will make the nations your inheritance. Inheritance is a huge word when it talks. To it. Abraham was promised land for inheritance. He was promised that his seed that was multiplied like the sands of the seashore would have an inheritance, would have lots. Jesus Christ was promised things very directly also. He was promised that the nations, all the nations were going to be his inheritance. He was going to rule. Well, let's read it. <laughs> I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with the rod of iron, and you will dash them into pieces like a pottery. It, it's he was. It's going to. I mean, his. This is Hebrewism, but it's his word is law. <laughs> the Lord speaks it. He speaks for God. That's the way it'll be. Now, I got news for you, folks. That ain't happening right now. And I'll even go one step further. If the Lord is in charge of all the nations right now, he's not doing a very good job. All you have to do is click on the 6 o'clock news any evening to find out this world is a mess. This is not happening. And it's not going to happen until the Lord returns with all of the Hagion, the word says. All the Hagion. All the holy ones. Because that's part of the plan. Uh, promises in plural in the Christian writings, this is three of them, just to give you an idea of how it's used. <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 1, 19, it says, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is proclaimed among you by me, Silas and Timothy, <clears throat> was not yes and no, but in, in him, there's that word again, that Greek word, in him it has always been yes and and for all, all, how many of them? All the promises of God are yes in Christ Jesus. All the promises of God are going to, Jesus Christ is going to fulfill God's word to not only uh, planet Earth, but to all of creation. Christ is going to fulfill that. And so through him, Jesus Christ, are amen. Spoken 
to the glory of God. So be it. So be it. We can do, hey, all the Jesus Christ is going to fulfill all the promises of God. Now, this isn't specifically talking about promises made to the church, but it is inclusive of those because how many of the promises of God are yes in Christ? All of them. All of them are yes and amen. God is not going to fail on any promise he's ever made to any human being on the planet. He's not going to fail on any covenantal relationship that he has made. Even with the covenant of the law, even though Israel blew it, they blew it to pieces. They, they did not keep their end of the bargain. God promised a what? New covenant for them. He's going to make a new arrangement after they're raised from the dead when he restores the kingdom of Israel. One that they will uh, have the ability and the willingness to uphold their end of the bargain too. Now it is God who establishes both us and you in Christ. He anointed us. In Romans 9.3 it says, this is Paul talking about his people. Now he's an Israelite. He's, that's his nation. For I could wish myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers. That's how much he loved his, his family. His, I mean, it was different than church wasn't just a congregation of people from the neighborhood. They were your brothers and your sisters and your cousins and your aunts. And you're all from the same tribe. Paul was from the tribe of Benjamin. He could trace his heritage back with these people. And he says uh, he, he wanted them to understand what was going on here about Christ. I wish myself cut off for the sake of my brothers, my own flesh and blood. The people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption of sons. Theirs is the divine glory and the covenants. Theirs is the giving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises, plural. All these things came through the, through the nation of Israel. They were going to be manifesting this. Verse 5, theirs are the patriarchs. That's anytime it talks about patriarchs, it's always Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them proceeded the human descent of Christ, the, line, the lineage. They had the lineage of Christ in their midst. Who is God over all, forever worthy of praise? Amen. Romans chapter 15, 7. Accept one another. Then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring glory to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a, this is a very good thing. Christ has become, what is Christ become? A servant of the Jews. Christ has become a servant of the Jews. The Jew thing is not over. <laughs> He's just, Jesus Christ just now received the power necessary to be a, a uh, uh, a minister to the circumcision, the Jews. He has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth. Why? To confirm the promises made to the patriarchs. Who is the patriarchs? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why has Jesus become a servant to the Jews? To confirm the promises made to the patriarchs so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy, as it is written. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing hymns to your name. There was no secret that, that all the Gentiles too. That's a, a lot of believers get a little messed up on it because Gentiles. It's, Gentiles is basically all the other nations of the world. <laughs> Anybody who's not a Jew or an American, if you say you're an American, you're a Gentile. Uh, you're out of the nations of the world. If you're in Italian, you're in a you're a Gentile. You're out of the nations of the world, unless you actually have Jewish heritage. Uh, you're 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 considered one of the other nations. But thank God that that none of that matters anymore because we're all getting called out of the muck and mire of this world. But there was no secret. Matter of fact, as I said earlier, Abraham was promised that in his seed. The, all the nations of the world would be blessed. That was a promise made to Abraham. God is not just the God of the Jews. He's the God of everybody. He's the God of everybody. He's God. He's the creator. He's the one that started this whole show. Um, 
And the, and the other thing I want to point out, especially in this uh, 2 Corinthians one uh, twenty, it says, no matter how many promises God has made, meaning that things that have already been spoken or written in the word, has made, has tense, you understand? Has made, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ Jesus. So it's not specifically speaking about the Christians, and there's a good reason for that. There's a good reason why it's not speaking about the Christians or the uh, the saints, if you want to uh, be more specific, the hagion of us. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul is... Paul's working with the Corinthian church, the, the group that are over there, and they're having some practical application problems, uh, orgies and getting drunk, and uh, some of their members are starving to death uh, while they're feasting out and partying. And he's trying to set them straight on a lot of things, but the first thing he wants to set them straight on is their relationship. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 through 13, he's talking about his relationship with them. He wants to. He wants to make sure they're cool that, that they that they listen to what he has to say. And by the time he gets for the fourteen, he tells them not to be yoked together with unbelievers. Or what do the righteous have with the wicked that have the common? Uh, or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Baal? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Now, now he's going to say as Christians, but he's going to quote Hebrew scriptures to make his point. When we say that, when we say that the, the, the things that were written past were written for our learning, it does not mean they don't apply to us. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. He, and again, it's not fulfilled yet. It's, it's gone, but not yet quite gone. The new covenant is here. Jesus Christ has been made a minister of the covenant, but it's not quite here. And here we are ballooning up in the middle of this. But he's going to quote Hebrew scriptures to them that tell people how to live. Uh, and tell the relationships they're supposed to have with their creator. Uh, he quotes Leviticus, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. It says, I will live with them and walk among them and be their God, and they will be my people. Now that, when it was prophesied of, is talking future for Israel. When? After the resurrection of the dead. But it applies to Christians today because he is living with us. We're the temple. <laughs> He's walking among us. The God is within you to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's what the word says. A lot of the things that were promised to Israel in the resurrection have becoming a living reality in his children today, in the grace administration, in the administration of the sacred secret. Verse 17 says, Therefore come out of them and be separate, said the Lord. Don't touch the unclean things, and I will receive you. That's from Isaiah, Ezekiel. But that's talking about Israel. It's talking about what they, now that's practical application for them to live at that time. But it's also application for what he will do in the new covenant with them. Because by the time Isaiah and Ezekiel were writing, uh, Israel wasn't doing too good at coming out of them. They were, they were probably worse than them. So it was still a future context. Uh, 18 says, and I will be a father to you, and you will be sons and daughters. That's in Isaiah 3. There was no, Israel was expecting a promise of life from the promise. The promise of salvation has been a clear-cut promise all the way since the fall of mankind. However, None of it was to be fulfilled until the resurrection of the dead. Here we find ourselves in the middle of this 
wonderful time period that has lasted better than 2,000 years now, and we have that life welling within us, which is totally amazing. Uh, after, after, after all of these Hebrew consorts that Paul is irking the Corinthians to listen to, in verse 7, should we don't, I mean, chapter 7, we don't, shouldn't even start another chapter. It says, what's the first word? Therefore. What's the therefore, therefore? Therefore, beloved, since we have these promises. See, these promises are to us too. Whether, whether they're being fulfilled in us now through the gift of Holy Spirit that we have alive within us, or whether they become part of our help for the future. Jesus Christ is not king. He's not reigning on earth. So we know that is a future vision for us. We have all these promises. And that's that, that vision of those promises of the fulfillment of God's word with Jesus Christ coming back with his saints, all of them. That's all of them. There's there's Hagion in heaven. There's a lot of Hagion. We're actually joining them. <laughs> it says, since we have these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that defiles the body and spirit, perfecting the holiness and the fear of God. Perfecting is a little screwed up word in the English. It means maturing, growing, moving forward, <sighs> having a desire to be better for God than what we were yesterday perfecting holiness in the fear of god making room for us in your hearts fellowship we have wronged no one we've corrupted no one we've exploited no one we all just wanted to have fellowship with these guys to lead them along and for them to understand how much he knew in the word <clears throat> now as far as what we do do because we know there were promises made Promises were made, things were said, you know. Uh, is that like a, a gangster movie thing? Uh, but there were promises made. God made a lot of promises. And one of the promises that is expressed quite frankly in Galatians is the promise he made to Abraham that all nations would be blessed because of him. And I think this is quite interesting the way Galatians 3.10 starts out and ends up. And uh, we're going to end here today and pick this back up at another time concerning this because our hope is a lot more than so shall we ever be with the Lord. The question is, what are we going to be doing with the Lord? What's our function? Why did God call out this time period to be? Why did he put that gap? Why did he insert this? Something that Ephesians says was in his heart from before the foundations of the world to get to this point. Why? What's the purpose? There are, there's a few of them. We're going to look at one of them here and pick up on some more later on. In Galatians 3.10 it says, For all who rely on the works of the law, speaking now, Galatians, you understand Galatians now. We just got out of Corinthians, which was a uh, reproof epistle. Because the practical thing, the things that they were practicing were just out of whack. They were, they were doing some nutty things, and Paul's trying to get them to stop hurting themselves by what they practice. Galatians is a uh, correctional epistle. It is correcting the doctrinal errors that were not picked up or adhered to the, out of Romans. So uh, there's a legal problem. Every there are people that are trying to lure the Galatians into the law, back in under the bonds of the covenant, the the one that is falling away, the one that is <laughs> that they couldn't keep because they weren't able to keep it. They're being lured back into it, pressured back into it. And Paul's dealing with them. He's dealing with, it with Timothy. He's dealing with it with the, the the church in Jerusalem. It's a mess in what he's had to deal with with this. And when you think about it, it's pretty cool because. Even today, it's, we're, people are being called out of national, national uh, uh, religiosity, if you will. I am, a, I'm a, I am a member of the English Guard. I love England or America or whatever. Or I am a Roman Catholic or a Baptist. They're being called out of their religious order or their national order or both into one 
new man. Nothing has changed. This writings are as prevalent to us today as they were to these people 2,000 years ago. I've been in Galatians 3.10. It says, for all who rely on the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, curse is everyone who doesn't continue to do everything written in the book of the law. And Romans went through and said, uh, it was too hard. <laughs> Nobody could keep the law. That's why Jesus Christ had to come and do it for us. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by trust. The word pistis should be trust. Faith is trust in God. The righteous shall trust God. The law is not, the law is not based on trust. In contrary, it says you do it or you die. <laughs> you, you do it or you won't get blessed. It's based on uh, 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 bondage. It's based to hold people in, to keep them contained, to stop them from going evil. It's not based on, on faith, on trust in God. It's based on you do it this way. Everybody wants to, everybody wants to get, okay, we're going to heal now. And these are the 16 steps to healing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Well, this is the way God designed it to work. He designed it to be a relationship. We're supposed to trust him, go to him, look to him in every circumstance, at every moment. He wants that relationship. The law is not based on that, on faith, trust. On the contrary, it says a person who does these things will live by them. That's what you got to do. You live by them or die by them. Christ, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. Now listen to, now what you think about everything we talked about as we look, as we look at the first, verse 14, because it's going to give a reason why us. Okay? And a lot of people want this to be the blessings that were spoken to Abraham about the Gentiles being us, the body of Christ, the one new man. But Ephesians says, no, that can't be because nobody knew about the body of Christ. Nobody knew. And guess what? The body of Christ isn't just Gentiles. It is Jews and Gentiles, slave and free. There is no, there is no consideration of, of any separation. Everybody's coming up out of the cesspool. <laughs> Everybody's coming to the one new man. This was specifically a promise to Abraham that by his seed, Christ, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Stay with me here. <clears throat> he redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham, which was that all the nations would be blessed, might come to the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. So by faith, we might receive the promise, not a promise, not some of the promises, the promise, the same promise that Jesus Christ received, the same promise that Jesus Christ is, Christ in you, the hope of glory, you are the one that's going to help the Lord bring the blessing that was promised to the nation to Abraham. You are going to come back with the Lord. You're going to be part of that Hagion to bring that blessing to all the nations of the world. The Lord will be you so shall you ever be with the lord you're going to be working you're going to be bringing that blessing and helping for as just as you're supposed to be doing now light shining except for hopefully it'll be a much brighter place during the thousand years millennium so i guess we can consider this our training program <laughs> that the, that the, given to abraham might come to the gentiles in through through is in Christ Jesus. That's the exalted one. So that by faith we might receive the promise of Holy Spirit. That is the purpose. That is one of the purposes for the body of Christ to be part of that Hagion, to come back to this earth when Jesus Christ returns, to bring the blessing, to help administer that blessing to all the nations of the world for a thousand years. So that's what I got on the first session. Oh, that was pretty awesome. Thank you, sir.
Uh, there's a lot more. Um, as, I just kind of like that thing when uh, when you uh, when you start looking in the Hebrew scriptures about prophecies about Jesus Christ, you always I see Jesus everywhere. But when the Christian church, at, when as Christians we start realizing that we are gathered together before the wrath hits, that we do go with the Lord to a, to heaven above the earth into the clouds uh, for a period of time, and that we do return with him, then all of a sudden you start reading the scriptures and you start seeing, oh, wow, that's what we're going to be doing. So shall we ever be with the Lord? So we're going to be doing what he tells us to. <laughs> Just like.